Philistine. People from their homes and off their land. Out of a bitter and bloody struggle, the state of Israel was born. But throughout the length and breadth of this new nation, silent reminders of this land's former inhabitants, the Palestinians, can be seen. Three million Palestinians now live in exile. The Palestinians are in a unique position of watching and obviously participating in their own dispossession and watching their oppressors celebrated, not as oppressors, but as victims. The identity of the Jew in pre-1945 Europe as the victim, as the persecuted uh, target of the Holocaust has persisted, even as the, the, the images that flood the television screens of Israeli Air Force jets napalming and strafing refugee camps, throwing tear gas into hospitals, beating people up, blowing up houses, all of that, the Palestinians are portrayed as the perpetrators. And it's one of the most preposterous in the literal sense of the word, preposterous and, and, and grotesque fates for any people to endure. I'll never forget what I saw at the Palestinian refugee camp. Men, women, and children, their bodies stacked up in piles. Clouds of white tear gas drifted over the area. Many of the worshippers moved quickly out of the mosque. We have to be more surgical in our uh, action. Some of them are waving homemade flags of Palestine, and a flag which is outlawed in Israel. The Palestinian revolution continues. Mr. President and gentlemen, empires rise and fall. History tells us of the empires of the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks and the Romans, the Arabs, the Persians and the Spaniards. Today, most of the talk is about the Americans and the Russians. On November the 29th, 1947, the United Nations General Assembly voted on a resolution calling for the partition of Palestine into two separate Arab and Jewish states. The resolution of the Dutch Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstention. We, from a nationalist point of view, we did not accept the partition plan because it gave the Israelis, Jews at that time, more than 55% of the land, total land of Palestine. Under the UN partition plan, the Jewish state was granted more than half the area of Palestine. The Jews numbered a third of the population and owned less than one-tenth of the land. The Arabs would be given the rest. Jerusalem would become an international city under the UN. Both Jewish and Arab states would be linked by an economic union. I mean, I was 18 at the time. And as a student in the last year of the secondary school, we discussed the issue. What's going to be the outcome of this violent action? And I think in our wildest imagination, we could not have foreseen any possible chance for the Palestinians to lose in that confrontation. We could not foresee the possibility of the establishment of an Israel at the expense of Palestine. The Palestinians were unprepared for a war with the Jews. Palestinian society was still underdeveloped and the majority of its people clung to their old way of life. They looked to the Arab states for support. Abdullah of Transjordan, Farouk of Egypt, and Ibn Saud of Arabia unite the Arab world against the Jewish state. The Arab regimes, each backing rival sections in the Palestinian leadership, were reluctant to get involved in the Palestine dispute. King Abdullah of Transjordan continued to enjoy British support while Britain prepared to quit Palestine. He coveted the Arab half of Partition Palestine and held secret talks with both the Zionists and with British Foreign Minister Ernest Bevan to realize his ambition. Bevin uh, always thought 
uh, that if partition was, if it was necessary, he, he was anti-partitionist, basically, but if, 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 if it became essential to accept partition, the Arab part of Palestine should be united with Transjordan. Uh, that, uh, that it should become part of, uh, part of the state of Jordan. I think he thought, I mean, I think he was right, uh, that um, what remained in Arab hands after the United Nations partition was put into effect was not capable of being self-supporting, wasn't viable. And together, in link with the other great Arabic peoples and ourselves, preserve what is valuable to them and to us. Uh, Bevin did give the king, King Abdullah, to understand that um, the entry of the Arab region into Palestine would be acceptable to us, provided they didn't cross the partition line laid down by the United Nations. The Zionists had a functioning government, the Jewish Agency, and an underground army of 30,000 soldiers known as the Haganah. The Jewish Agency, led by David Ben-Gurion, was divided over partition. Most were in favor, but Ben-Gurion wanted a larger Jewish state. Recent research has revealed the form their discussions took. Should the Zionists prepare for all-out war, or could they and the Palestinians reach a compromise based on petition? The Haganah thought that there can be arrangement with the Palestinians and with the uh, Arab states on the basis of the United Nations uh, resolution. And uh, from what, from the documents I have seen, from the talks which took place between the two sides, between Palestinian Arabs uh, on, uh, on national level and uh, with Arab states, I'm sure uh, they were right. There, w there was such uh, uh, an alternative that Palestinians and the Arab states will uh, accept uh, partition. The likelihood of an all-out Arab-Jewish conflict would depend on what happened in the areas of Palestine where Arabs and Jews lived and worked side by side. In the first days after the UN partition vote, riots and attacks by Arabs on Jews and by Jews on Arabs did occur, but the majority in both communities held back from war. Convinced their terror campaign had forced the British to quit Palestine, the extremist Jewish organizations, the Agun or Etsu, and the smaller Stern Gang, wanted the whole of Palestine for a Jewish state and rejected partition. They started attacking Arabs living in mixed Arab and Jewish cities. The idea was to pull the Arabs into the world. They knew about local arrangements with uh, the Haganah and the Jewish agency between uh, cities like Jaffa and Haifa and uh, between villages like, uh, um, like the villages around this kibbutz and uh, villages like Dir Yassin. They all have a network of uh, local alliances. Um, and uh, they thought the most important thing is to break those alliances. Haifa was Palestine's premier port and largest city, with a population of over 100,000 Jews and Arabs. Here, organizations representing Jewish and Arab workers made common cause to stop the spread of violence. Then, at the end of December 1947, the Irgun struck. Well, at the oil refineries, there were a mixed group of employees. Jews doing largely technical jobs, and now doing, doing labouring work. And each day there were a number of Arab would-be workers used to assemble on the grass verge outside the main gate of, to the refineries. On the morning of the 31st of December, 1947, a lorry containing some Jews passed these workers and robbed a couple of hand grenades amongst the people waiting for employment. Some were killed and others injured. Word then got around amongst the other Arabs employed within the refineries that the Jews had killed and wounded Arabs. So they then took immediate action and started killing off all the Jews they could get hold of. And in the event, some 47 Jews were, were killed. I believe that they 
action by these Jews who were throwing grenades amongst these Arabs waiting for employment was provocative and it was intended to induce a counter-attack to justify the Jews staging a further attack to drive the Arabs out of the area altogether. The definition of legal and illegal forces becomes daily more obscure. Haganah, the force first legally raised for the defense of Jewish settlements, appears to function hand in glove with Irgun Svailiumi, the outlawed terrorist army. Full-scale training is underway in a score of camps throughout the country. Ben-Gurion wanted to mobilize the Jews for war with the Arabs. After the Haifa oil refinery massacre, he rejected requests to suppress the Agun. Ben-Gurion's views represented a minority within the Jewish agency, so he now established secret contacts with Menachem Begin, the Irgun leader. Their joint strategy was to wage war on the Palestinians. Most of the Palestinians didn't want to take, to, uh, to take uh, side, but Ben-Gurion was not satisfied with it. He saw the most important thing is to hit hard at the Palestinians now, and he thought his friends and colleagues in the Jewish agency and in the Haganah doesn't understand what's really important now. By March 1948, although the British were still supposedly in charge, violence had spread to all parts of Palestine. It was becoming a cruel and bloody conflict. At first, Palestinian fighters were victorious. Their attacks on Jewish road convoys succeeded in isolating outlying Jewish settlements and placed Jewish West Jerusalem under siege. Among the Arab guerrilla chiefs, Abdul Khada El Husseini, nephew of the Mufti of Jerusalem, who was the Palestinians' exiled leader, proved himself an effective and inspiring military commander. Faced with this crisis, the Zionist leadership rallied behind Ben-Gurion. In early April 1948, he ordered a Haganah offensive, codenamed Plan Dalit, to defeat the Arab guerrilla armies. An elite force, the Haredel Brigade, was mobilized. When I assumed command, middle April, uh, 48 of the RL Brigade, we started with uh, military operations to make sure that the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem will not be endangered by the big villages or towns that were along the road. Uh, well formed, came all the attackers on the convoys. Uh, this was our first goal. The Arab village of Castel, perched high above the main Tel Aviv-Jerusalem road, became the scene of an epic struggle between Palestinian and Jewish warriors. The Harel Brigade ordered its soldiers to destroy the village bases of Abdul Khada's guerrilla army. Well, it was not pleasant. The uh, system was to attack the village, to give warning to the civilians to destroy the village, and by that to, to make sure that there will be no human resources to be called on emergency, as the Arab called it, the Faza, uh, which is uh, some sort of uh, calling up uh, for 24, 48 hours. Everyone brought his rifle, his uh, bit of pita and some uh, cheese that supplied him for about uh, 24 to 48 hours. And we knew that after 48 hours, part of those who participated, the mobilized nucleus, would have to return because of logistical reasons to his own village. By the elimination of the villages alone and adjacent to the road, we were sure that there would be no attacks. Palestinian villagers fled. They also lost Abdul Qadr, whose body they brought down from Castel, which had just been retaken by his fighters. Thousands of his followers crowded Jerusalem to mourn his death. Before he died, Abdul Qadr wrote, This land of brave men is our ancestors' land. On this land, the Jews have no claim. 
How can I sleep when the enemy is upon it? During Abdul Qadr's funeral, the Haganah seized Castell and held it for good. Three miles from Castell, outside Jerusalem, there existed a prosperous Arab village at peace with its Jewish neighbors called Dir Yassin. Early on April the 9th, 1948, 120 men and women from the Irgun and Stern gang attacked Dir Yassin. إطلاق النار عند الساعة أربعة صباحا يعني بلش يعني كان الخطة المتفق عليها اليهود مع بعضهم البعض إن الهجوم يكون يعني مثل ما الأربعة من جميع الجهات بلشت الرماية بتعرف بشكل عنيف يعني من الساعة أربعة للساعة تقريبا سبعة صباحا قنابل يعني يعني بدك كيف كانت تطيح عليها 20 قنبلة قنبلة ملاف مدفعية مورتر يعني هذا لحد ما طلع من الشمس صباحا يعني والضرب عنيف جدا يعني ضرب رشاشات وبرنات تعرف يعني شيء هذا يعني وبعدين في البيوت اللي احتلوهن بلشوا بتعرف ضرب في داخل البيوت يعني مش عرضوا هن مثل ما تقول هل الناس تشرد نفلت من اليهود يشردوا مهما من حد ما خشوا داروا يقتلوا خشوا على عيلة بحالها يعني مغبروها بحالها ضربوها كنابل وقتلوها كلها عيلة بحالها دار ما خلوا ولا واحد منهم يربط راح قتلوه طب احنا نسمع الصوت اللي يتكتلوا لما يصيحوا سياحة. اه نسمع سياحهم يعني مثل ما تقول اللي م... احنا اللي هان يسمع اللي في الدور هذلاك لما يقتلوهم اه لما ي... يطخوهم ويقتلوهم معلوم بدنا نسمع سياحة واللي ينكتلوا في الطريق احنا نشوفهم نتقابلينا يعني نشوف يعني عمي راح يعني مثل ما تكون راح يصلي يعني صدفوا له كل البيت جوا كتلوا طخوه جوا بوص البيت يعني والدتي يعني كانت في البيت لحالها وابني يعني من غرفه لغرفه طلع كوا بالغرفه وطخوه كتلوا هي وابني والولد الصغير هذا عمره سنه ونص سنه وشهر يعني Between 80 to 120 villages were slaughtered at Dir Yassin the exact figure remains in dispute Menachem Begin, the Irgun commander, congratulated his forces on what he called a splendid act of conquest. Although shocked and embarrassed, the Jewish agency still held back from crushing the Irgun. News of the massacre quickly spread from Jerusalem, creating fear throughout the entire Palestinian community. Now nobody felt safe. Until the point of Dir Yassin, they described us as sheep. They shouted, we're going to slaughter the Jewish sheep. And you can't go on with the same shouts because sheep, uh, sheep don't slaughter their... Uh, and so they had to change it and to describe us as wild beasts. It uh, actually frightened the enemies. They believed their own lies and they were sh shocked in such a state that they were not able to think clearly about the, uh, the real uh, military situation. So they started to flee. The Palestinians concluded that the Zionists were really after our blood that the Zionists will not differentiate between a peaceful person and a violent person. That what the Zionists want is the land without the people. A few yards from Jaffa's town hall, a pathy cameraman took these exclusive pictures of the latest bomb outrage. A heavy explosion had rocked the all-Arab city as the headquarters of the Arab National Committee was blown sky high. Following the UN petition vote, skirmishing broke out between Arab Jaffa and neighboring Jewish Tel Aviv. The British, busy winding up their administration in Palestine, stood aside. The Zionists enjoyed many advantages. The, in Jaffa, I was in charge of the intelligence net to note uh, we had an excellent net then. The most important one was the one of the prostitutes of, of, the, of the Jaffa, of the Arabs of Jaffa. They knew everything because British soldiers used to come there and visit and they got information and that's how we knew exactly when the British are leaving 
and we were first to enter. I think it became gradually more clear that the Zionists were extremely powerful, that the British were not about to defend the Palestinians, and that the Palestinians must rely on their own resources, which were minimal. At the end of April, the Arab states, shocked by the sudden collapse of Palestinian resistance, pressured the British to intervene. The British reoccupied Jaffa, too late to prevent a massive exodus by its demoralized, terrified population. When we entered Jaffa, I remember, in, in one, uh, the coffee was there. They, they, they didn't, they, they just left everything immediately. And that's how it happened. They were so much frightened because of their Arab leaders telling them who the Jews are, what monsters they are on one side, and the shelling of the Edsel on the other hand, the Haganah propaganda saying, look, if you are not going to be in a peaceful situation with us, so it's better that you leave. At a certain point, it became clear, because the city became deserted, that it was simply an act of foolishness on our part to stay. As young men, clearly we were candidates for liquidation if the Israelis came in or if the Zionist forces came in. And there was a Belgian ship, that's my memory, and one of the sailors, a young man, looked at us. I mean, the ship was full of people from Jaffa. Some of us are young, young uh, adults. And he said, why don't you stay and fight? I've never forgotten his phrase. And I literally had no good answer for him. Uh, but we took that ship and we went to Beirut. And we thought, well, in two weeks' time, three weeks' time, Maybe a month time, we'll get back to Jaffa, because that is not the end of the battle, we thought. On May the 13th, 1948, 24 hours before the expiry of the British mandate in Palestine, Zionist forces entered Arab Jaffa in triumph. Jaffa was a city which no Jew was, was uh, there to enter. It was very dangerous. So here you are, I'm a Jew, coming to Jaffa like a conqueror. It was a good feeling. On the other hand, I felt the human point of view, how, how tens of thousands of people are leaving their homes, going to nowhere. Throughout Palestine, the Zionists smashed the poorly organized and ill-equipped Palestinian forces. Fearing a repeat of the Dir Yassin massacre, Palestinians in their tens of thousands fled their homes. Many were driven out at gunpoint. Increasingly, it dawned on everybody, literally, and I speak in personal terms, that the situation was hopeless. And uh, therefore, the only thing to do is to leave. Now, if you lose Haifa, you lose Jaffa, you lose the surrounding countryside, you literally have lost the battle for the Palestinian Arab state. You have lost the battle for Palestinian independence. <laughs> At Haifa, the last British troops leave Palestine, and very few of them can have been sorry. As the tanks and soldiers went aboard the transports, the thought that a difficult and thankless job had been well done must have mattered much less than the prospect of going home. The Union Jack was hauled down, and the doors closed for good on the British mandate. Tel Aviv, key Jewish city, is all rejoicing as the elected head of the provisional government, David Ben-Gurion, arrives to read the proclamation of a new nation, the State of Israel. War with the Arab states for which Ben-Gurion had mobilized the entire Zionist movement now began. Armies from five Arab states and armed volunteers from all over the Arab world marched into Palestine. Isolated Jewish settlements and the Jewish quarter in the old city of Jerusalem were captured. Amid the carnage, 7,000 Jews now became refugees. By this time, more than 300,000 Palestinians had been uprooted from their homes. The first time I think that I literally understood that we are not going back to Jaffa and nobody is going back to their homes in Israeli-occupied Palestine was probably 
uh, in the summer of 48, that is July, August. That's the first when we began to read underground leaflets issued by nationalist groups attacking the Arab states and saying that the Arab states are in fact collaborating with the Zionists in the establishment of the State of Israel and frustrating the establishment of a Palestinian Arab state. That then we knew. King Abdullah of Transjordan now moved in to lay hands on the old city of Jerusalem. The Palestinian national community was being destroyed. The prospect for Palestinian independence was rapidly fading away. The UN now sent a mediation mission to Palestine. I had just got into my office one morning and was having my first cup of coffee when a friend called me from division headquarters saying that overnight they got a dispatch orders for me to report immediately to headquarters Marine Corps for a further uh, assignment on temporary duty to the State Department to go to Palestine and be in the UN mission there. And that's all I knew. <laughs> so I, I went home and told my wife, guess what? And she says, you're going somewhere. And I said, Palestine. And she says, oh my God, that's where the Bible was. Count Bernadotte, head of the Swedish Red Cross, was charged by the United Nations to bring peace to Palestine. He got the Arabs and the Israelis to agree to a 28-day truce that began on June the 11th, 1948. To assist him, Bernadotte assembled a team of soldiers from Scandinavia, Belgium, France and the United States. These men would be independent and important witnesses to events in Palestine. But once in the field, the UN observers found themselves powerless to stop the fighting. Theodore Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Well, the UN was speaking loudly but had no stick. Um, really, all we were doing was scorekeeping. Because neither side uh, had anything to fear from the UN. That it was, you know, it was toothless. Uh, they could shoot up Jerusalem or each other all they wanted. And we could report it. We could plead with them. And, uh, and we could report them back to the Security Council if nothing happened. And uh, here I was, I was the operations officer of a peacekeeping mission, and all I'd ever done is fight wars, and you know, I didn't know anything about peace missions. The UN was also unable to prevent the Israelis using the ceasefires to reorganize and re-equip. On July the 7th, the fighting resumed. The Israelis now went over to the offensive. Advancing into territory assigned by the UN to the Arab state of Petition Palestine, they seized the twin towns of Lida and Ramla from the Jordanian Arab Legion. More than 50,000 Palestinians who had refused to flee their homes suddenly came under Israeli occupation. In Lida, uh, after we captured, there was an attempt by the Arab Legion again to penetrate uh, Lida and in the struggle there, most of the population uh, pushed out. They came, the, the, the Jewish soldiers, and with microphones and loudspeakers. But that was early in the morning. And uh, uh, ordered that all the young men, uh, able-bodied men, be, be gathered into mosques and in, into, into churches. And they said that they would be back, you know, in a few hours. Many of these men never returned. The Israelis were alarmed by the number of Palestinians in Lida. In the uproar created by the Arab Legion raid, they shot the men detained inside one of the mosques. More than 80 were killed. Wherever there was a fighting in which there was a threat by the civilians, because uh, up to May 15, there was no clear line, uh, clear cut line between front and rear civilians and military and uh, in july we felt the same and therefore even though we did not initiate at the very beginning the story of uh, the population arab population of leader when the arab legion succeeded to penetrate again to leader and we saw the uprising of the population we had to carry out actions that practically brought about the evacuation of most of the population, not all, by the way. 
I just would follow the sound, you know, the sound of, of the tumult of those thousands of people, um, move along with them. Um, I think what was most memorable about this, perhaps, is the one is the thirst. Uh, we were very thirsty. Two is the heat. And three, the terror. The Israelis would uh, kept shooting, sometimes wantonly and sometimes uh, perhaps in earnest. Uh, we would hear big explosions behind us. Um, planes would uh, would go over, you know, fly low, and just to keep us moving, I think, and to keep us uh, terrified and moving. Um, I would hear people not moving, not walking, but lying on the ground. They couldn't, in other words, they couldn't move anymore. Sometimes I would hear the sound of the voice of a baby, of a woman with a baby, sometimes of old people lying down, unable to move. And this, would touch me much and sometimes it would uh, frighten me that I would perhaps have the same fate. Indeed, uh, it wasn't long before I had to sit down and uh, take rest, to take some rest, but then also uh, I would be afraid that I wouldn't be able to get up. Hundreds perished in the three-day march from Lida to the Arab Legion lines. For years, this episode was hidden from the outside world. In 1979, Yitzhak Rabin described the Lida Ramla expulsions in his autobiography. Israeli censors removed this section from his book. Every book which is written by any Israeli former general or politician, and he publishes something that uh, he got uh, from his uh, uh, official role, in addition to the military censorship, he has to pass it to a committee of members of the cabinet. And it was not the military censorship that uh, cut this uh, parts that you refer to, I assume. It was uh, made by political observation, and they had their own reasons. Israeli writer Peretz Kidron translated Rabin's Hebrew manuscript into English. In the book, uh, Rabin describes how the two towns were occupied, the fighting continued beyond the towns, and he as the commander, he and Yigal Alon, who was the, uh, the area commander, uh, were perplexed about this whole situation. They had tens of thousands of Arab civilians behind their lines, and they didn't know what to do. Uh, ben Gurion came to visit their frontline headquarters and they put the question to him and strangely enough Ben Gurion simply ignored the question and they asked him repeatedly again and again Ben Gurion ignored the question and it was only finally when they walked outside presumably to some place where Ben Gurion was absolutely certain that he couldn't be overheard and the question was put to him again by Yigal Alon Ben Gurion then made this gesture, which uh, very clearly implied, throw them out, drive them out. The Israeli high command now faced a difficult choice. Ben Gurion wanted to drive all Palestinians from territory seized by the Israeli army without wanting to make it public policy. The decision to prevent Palestinians from returning once they had fled was easier to make. Ben-Gurion and his commanders could justify this for reasons of military security. Sometimes the Israelis allowed the Palestinians to stay. In Nazareth, which fell to the Israelis in the same week as Lida Ramna, senior clergymen and town leaders persuaded Israeli officers not to drive their people out. Confrontation with the Christian churches with congregations in Nazareth was too great a risk for the fledgling Israeli state, anxious to win international approval. But in places out of the limelight, like Safuri, a Palestinian village three miles from Nazareth, the Israeli army applied its usual policy of eviction. Sar kanat fi qiyadi hun min al-Arab. Ajo qadu yidharabu hunu wiyaha. 
القياده انهزمت واحنا ظلينا في البلد ورافعين اعلام بيضه تنضل بعد ما راحوا هذاك طوقوا البلد وقالوا اذا واحد بيبقى فيها بنطقه يا بنحبسه وهاللي وجدوه ظل بعد المسافه اللي اعطوهن اياها طخوه والباقي اطلعوه العاجز حملوه بالسيارات ويرموه على القرى وبعدين اجوا مسكوها وهدوها اياها جابوا الغام وجابوا اشياء وصاروا هدوا في البلد On occasions, fanatical hatred among Israeli soldiers towards the Arabs led to massacres. On October the 29th, approximately 570 men, women and children were killed when soldiers from the Israeli 8th Brigade attacked the village of Dewaime in southern Palestine. What happened in the school, the day, 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 the ورموهم في مصفى الشيد هذا اللي حصل وفي الشوارع لما دخلوا ما كانش في عندهم لا شفقه ولا رحمه يعني بدوا الطخ اللي في الشوارع اللي شوفوه يقتلوه واللي واللي في الدور قتلوه الاختياري العجزي والعجائز الحريم الكبار هذا اللي حصل From the very beginning, the Israeli government tried to obscure its responsibility for the Palestinian exodus. As early as August of 1948, while the expulsions were still taking place, the Israeli foreign minister was writing a letter to the Secretary General of the United Nations in which the myth was already evolving. He was telling the Secretary General of the UN that Palestinians had left on orders from local commanders and from the Arab higher committee. Of course, later on, Zionist uh, propagandists elaborated on this and developed the entire myth that the uh, Palestinians had not been expelled, indeed they had not fled, but it was part of a Palestinian conspiracy on orders from the Arab higher command telling their people to leave their homes, thus exonerating the Zionists from all guilt. For nearly 40 years, Zionist myths about the Palestinian catastrophe have been accepted in the West as truth. But recently, historians researching among Israeli state papers and in the archives at the UN have concluded that the vast majority of Palestinians did not leave voluntarily. There were no Arab radio broadcasts telling them to leave. They left either through fear of massacre or as a direct result of killings and forcible eviction. Israel bears historical responsibility, not only for driving the Palestinians out, but also for preventing their return. In July and August 1948, Count Bernadotte tried to persuade the Israelis to allow some of the now half million homeless Palestinians to return. This request, along with his proposals for a territorial solution of the Palestine dispute, was rejected by Moshe Sharet, Israel's foreign minister. Bernadotte now started to receive death threats. On September the 17th, 1948, while visiting Jerusalem, Bernadotte was ambushed by the Stern Gang. Along with a senior French UN official, he was shot dead in his car. Bernadotte's plans died with him. The initiative now lay with the Israelis. With nearly 70,000 regular troops, they faced Arab opponents lacking their numbers, fighting skills and determination. Ben-Gurion could now exercise his government's authority without challenge. He had already suppressed the Urgun. Bernadotte's death now allowed him to move against the Stern Gang. He was now the undisputed political master of Israel, the principal architect of the new Jewish state. The final phase of the fighting could now begin. We felt uh, 
say, in the political level, in the military level, that the key to end the war would be the defeat of Egypt. Egypt was the most powerful Arab country, uh, and no doubt, once Egypt would, would be, either uh, politically and no doubt militarily, out of the war, it would advance uh, ending the war of independence. From our point of view in the UN, it was a decisive turning point for Dr. Bunch, who had been trying all the time to negotiate some end to that fighting and um, uh, get them to sit down and write an armistice and stop the war. Arriving by air, the Egyptian delegation came to Rhodes for armistice talks with the Israelis. The meeting was being held at the Hotel des Roses under the auspices of UNO. The question of the Negev, the Jewish occupation of which was an accomplished fact, was an important discussion point. Our picture shows the Israeli delegates in conference at the beginning of the talk. Here are the United Nations representatives under the presidency of Dr. Bunch, the acting mediator. On February the 22nd, 1949, after weeks of negotiations, the Israelis and the Egyptians signed an armistice. In the next five months, the other Arab states, except Iraq, signed similar agreements with the Israelis. The UN mapmakers drew up the armistice lines, separating the Israeli and Arab armies. The original UN partition plan gave the Zionists just over half the area of Palestine. But by the conclusion of hostilities in July 1949, the Israelis now possessed three quarters of the land. Most of the remainder of Arab Palestine had been annexed by Jordan to become the area known as the West Bank. Jerusalem was split between Israel and Jordan. A narrow piece of Palestinian territory remained in Egyptian hands. This became known as the Gaza Strip. Palestine had disappeared. Israelis closed off their state from the rest of the land. As well as deterring Arab attackers, the barbed wire could also stop Palestinian refugees infiltrating back to their homes. 150,000 Palestinians were left inside the frontiers of the new Jewish state. A full peace treaty between Israel and the Arab states was never signed. Israel remained at war with her Arab neighbors. The results of the war of independence created a state of the Jewish nation. About 15% of the total population non-Jewish, 85% Jewish. And in a way, it facilitated to Israel to focus uh, on its main purpose, bringing in Jewish immigrants, building our society, our nation, our economy, all the infrastructure of any normal nation. The scene is near Jericho, one of the camps for Arab refugees. The story is one of destitution. For these people, as the result of the war in Palestine, have either fled or been expelled from their homes and their livelihoods. A total of three quarters of a million Palestinians had been exiled, kept apart from the rest of Arab society by governments which had reluctantly offered them refuge. These exiles were left to brood on their fate, dependent upon relief agencies for their survival. Most of the refugees had the hope to return very shortly in their home. Therefore, in the beginning, they were not so in favor of establishing uh, something very definite. They want to, to remain in a very provisory state. But uh, nevertheless, the Red Cross did its best to establish camps uh, well organized with big tents, with medical support, later on with schools, which all watch is what the life, the new life of a village or a small city. These camps were not very far from the Israeli border. Uh, certain refugees could see their village on the other side, and they were still thinking, we, we will return, we want to return. 
in their heart, they all had the wish to return. And they couldn't imagine that they would live in such a situation of refugee for, for years. سلوان جينا هان سكن في في خيمة في خيام وما فيش مطرح اللي مثل ما تقول يعني اللي واحد يقعد لا في دار ولا في بيت ولا في شغلة خيام جابوا لنا الوكالة خيام وسكننا في خيام بعدين احنا عيلة يعني الخيمة كانت تشتى سعنا صرنا ندوك طوب طينا من هذا الطوب ونبني سوينا بيت بيتين هيك إن اللي يسعنا احنا العيلة وقعدنا فيها وما هذاك يوم وهذا يوم وإحنا هان ساكنين يعني كيف عشت يعني وشو بدنا نسوي غصبا عنا شوية من الوكالة يعطي يساعدونا وشوية هالاختيار يروح يطقطق ويجيب لهم شغلة عاملة هو لا يبقى وشلي مزغار السعى الولاد يعني فيش فيهم واحد اللي يجيب ومشان يأكل يجيب يأكل هو لحالة كل مزغار ولاد مدارس السعى أصغر واحد بكى عاحدني ابن شه ابن سنة وشهرين شعوري كانت منهارة شو شعوري كيف اللي بدش يرملك ودارة و... وأراضي ورزقة وبيجي هان يقعد في أرض صحراء ما غصب عنا ش... شعورك بدها تنهار يا الواحد Having lost the struggle for the land, the Palestinians were now written out of its history. There's an underlying thread of reluctance uh, within the Zionist movement and in, in Israel to come to terms with the existence of the Palestinian people. This goes back right to the very beginning of the Zionist movement when someone coined the slogan, uh, a land without a people for a people without a land the Jews being a people without a land and Palestine presumably being a land without a people which was a very neat symmetry except for the fact that there was a people in the land of Palestine the Palestinian people and therefore the existence of the Palestinians rather spoiled this symmetry and that existence had in some way to be denied or played down or overlooked within I would say half a dozen years after the establishment of the state 1948 a, a whole constellation uh, of to my mind ideological fictions gained currency in western political and intellectual discourse so much so that 40 years after the fact today 1988 with the revelation to the west of what in fact happened in 1948 and the history of the early years of the state and all of that has not begun to even dislodge this it's 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 remained a kind of canonical uh myth or set of myths or constellation of myths in western society that is that has extracted from the palestinians a massive price and we're still paying that price The struggle for the land of Palestine still continues. Israel is the only state in the world which refuses to set a limit on its frontiers. Palestinians today remain convinced that Israel will not rest until it has driven all of them from their land. أنا جيت عليه ببور في أرضي قلت شو بدك تزرع هون قال لي انت مالك اطلع من هون قلت له أنا بدي أنصحك أنا صاحب الأرض هاي وبعرف شو كانت تطلع قال لي بدي أزرع زتون قلت له هاي مش أرض زتون هاي الزتون اللي فيها عنا كان ما فيوش زيت قال انت مالك روح هسه بجيب لك البوليس وبطحات يا رجل أنا ما بدي أغشك أنا بدي أنصحك ودي أعطيك عبرة أنا صاحب الأرض من 200 سنة وعرفها شو فيه أنت أولى مني فيها أنا بديش أقول لك روح 
وبقدر لو بدي اضرره بخلع الزتون وبرميه بره لكن نصحته اسا لما صار الزيت والزتون خلي يا عمي انا متاسف انا متاسف صحيح هاي شفتوا السحار فينا هن وقولوا لنا شو نزرع وعايشين معاهن مدة احنا ما ضررنا هنش وبنحب نعيش معاهن شايف وبدنا السلام معاهن اما اعطيني حقي اعطيني ارضي اللي الي